Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Inspirational Moments. I am Reverend Glendale Miller from the beautiful islands of the Bahamas. This program is designed to inspire, motivate, and encourage as you make a difference right where you are. I invite you in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, how thankful we are that you have brought us to the last month in a very challenging but meaningful year. We give you thanks for your keeping power, for your grace, for your mercy. Bless, we pray, our efforts. May your people be saved. May they be strengthened and encouraged. This we ask in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and certainly a very warm and cordial welcome is extended. I want to take this opportunity in welcoming all of you uh, to the beginning of Advent as we pause and give God thanks for sending his son into this dying world. I point you this morning to the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter, and our reading is found in verse number 23. Behold a virgin shall be with child behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is being interpreted God with us. I like that and I believe that's a good place for us to attach a subject to this word, this dialogue, this discussion this morning. I want to talk about the joy of having God with us. The joy of having God with us. Why don't you repeat that? The joy of having God with us. Have you ever had someone say to you, I have some good news and some bad news. Which do you want to hear first? How many of you want the good news first? How many of you want the bad news first? How many just don't want to be in that position at all. Sometimes to understand and appreciate the good news, we have to know what the bad news is. We are in the season of Advent. Advent literally means the coming or the arrival 
For us as believers, Advent is associated with the coming of Jesus Christ to the earth to provide salvation by his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Believers today look forward in anticipation to the second advent of Christ, in which Christ will return to the earth in a bodily form, in bodily form to receive the church and to judge the nations. The term advent also refers to a season of the church year during which the church prepares to commemorate Christ's first coming to earth at Christmas. The first four Sundays before Christmas Day make up the Advent season. That is why sometimes Advent begins in November and other times in December. Have you ever been singing a song for years and then discover that a phrase you've been singing for years is not what is really in the song? You catch yourself saying, I never heard that before in that song. Sometimes things that seem so familiar are distortions of what is really being stated in the song. Sometimes we learn Christmas carols at an early age. I know for me, it was always a joy to hear the Christmas carols. And even now as an adult, it brings such a delightful joy and excitement in my heart and when I look on the faces of so many there is a sense of excitement as well. One of my favorite songs is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. But who is Emmanuel and what exactly is he supposed to do when he gets here? The tune of the song causes the emotions of sadness and hope to rise up in us. It is obvious that things are going to change when Emmanuel arrives. Emmanuel literally means God with us and is only four times in the Bible, three times in Isaiah chapter 7 and once in Matthew chapter 1. In both places, there is a struggle going on with a person, and they don't know exactly what to do or where God is at the moment. God's people were known as the nation of Israel. They would often disobey God and go after idols to worship. And at times, God would let them suffer the consequences of their actions. This often meant being defeated at the hands of the nations around them. As a nation, they would often only seek God when they were in trouble from warring nations instead of seeing God as the almighty God, worthy of praise and honor, they kept God at a distance until things really got bad and they had nowhere else to turn. They wanted a God, but not one that expecting them to live righteous lifestyles. The king of Israel at the time was King Ahaz, 
and Jerusalem was his capital city. Two armies had surrounded the city and held it captive, but they could not overthrow it. King Ahaz had received word that they had contacted a third king to come and help them overthrow Jerusalem. He and the people in the city were terrorized with fear. King Ahaz himself was not walking with the Lord. He was doing a number of things God had ordered never to be done. Ahaz had even sacrificed one of his sons in the fire to a pagan god. Yet with all he had done contrary to the will of God, God had compassion on him and the people. God sent the prophet Isaiah to him to let him know that his enemies would not prevail. They would not enter the city of Jerusalem, and the people being held captive in the city would be set free. Isaiah asked the king, what sign would you like to see to know that God was going to do this? The king refused to ask for a sign because his pride wanted to continue to handle things his way. If he asked for a sign and got it, then he knew he would have to admit he was not serving the Lord. Sometimes we ask God for a sign, but we don't want to accept the changes required of us when the sign comes through. So Isaiah said, I'm going to give you a sign so that when it happens, everybody will know that God is the one who brought about the deliverance. Isaiah told him, a virgin will have a child who will be called Emmanuel. And by the time the child is two years old, the nations attacking Israel would be destroyed. When people heard about Isaiah's prophecy, no doubt they looked forward and mostly uh, unlikely, they prayed that the child Emmanuel would be conceived and come to them quickly so that they would be granted deliverance. The second time we see the name Emmanuel show up is in the Gospel of Matthew. We are introduced to Joseph. Joseph was called a righteous man. He was looking forward to his upcoming completion of his marriage. He was engaged to this beautiful young woman by the name of Mary. They had their official engagement with their parents having exchanged a gifts and dowry. They were now in that one year waiting period between the engagement and the final wedding banquet. The couple lived separate and apart for a year, which was to guarantee that the father would be the father of whatever child was born in the marriage. This stage of the process was one of such commitment that you would have to get a legal divorce as a couple to go your separate ways. Mary had come to Joseph with some good news and some bad news. The good news is that God 
had sent an angel to her to let her know that she would be given birth to the Son of God who would save his people from their sin. The bad news is that they didn't have much time to get ready for anything because she was already pregnant by the Holy Ghost. How many of you are thinking that Joseph might be thinking? There's, there's some worse bad news that they didn't have much time to get ready for the child. Keep in mind, Mary was, Mary has been out of town for three months visiting her aunt Elizabeth. What would you do if your fiancé went out of town unpregnant and come back pregnant? You know the two of you have come close to having physical intimacy and the only name she will give you is the Holy Spirit since he is convinced Mary's story is not true and that she has betrayed him. Joseph's life goes into a tailspin. What should he do? This child coming into his life was an absolute disappointment. It's amazing what God can do with our disappointments if we do not give up hope and remain faithful. Joseph could have let his anger determine his next step, but he didn't. He really wanted to do the right thing. When it all boils down to the bottom line, Joseph has but three choices. One, he can publicly humiliate Mary because of what he perceived to be her immorality. This choice could possibly lead to her death under the law, for she would be guilty of adultery, according to Deuteronomy 22, verses 13 and through 21. Secondly, he can divorce her quietly and just walk away from her, leaving her to raise the child in shame and poverty. And then thirdly, he can marry her and raise the child as if it were his own. This last option would really have been chosen. Joseph, being a righteous man, needed wisdom to make a decision. Unfortunately, he made a compassionate decision but it was not the best decision. Joseph decided to divorce Mary quietly without making any accusations, but that meant that he would have to take some of the financial responsibility for raising this child. He obviously cared for Mary, and as the scripture says, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He also knew that in taking this route, he would be putting her, putting his own reputation at stake. Many would believe he was the father of the child and had backed out on the deal for some unknown reason. Had he found somebody else, there would be plenty of speculation going on. Sometimes, even when we have all the facts 
in front of us, we still can see or understand the whole picture. God may be up to something in a situation that we simply cannot understand with our earthly wisdom. The Gospel of John does not give us an account of the birth of Jesus, but it does begin with letting us know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word for word is logos in the Greek, and it is associated with knowledge, reasoning, wisdom. In O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the third verse of the song asks for wisdom to come from on high, to put order to all things. Wisdom is to show us the path of knowledge that we need in order to go in the right direction. Joseph didn't know it, but God had preordained this union between him and Mary, and God was going to see to it that it came to pass. Just when Joseph was about to feel okay with the cause of action he was about to take. God sent him off in a different direction. God sent wisdom from on high through an angel in a dream who explained to him the rest of the story. The scriptures tell us, but after he had considered this, and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Ghost. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I believe that Joseph was wanting, Joseph somehow wanting uh, some direction from God to know that God was still with him even in the midst of what seemed like a terrible loss. God gave that dream to Joseph. Anybody else could have dismissed it as wishful thinking or too many uh, see it as a distortion of your imagination. The point is that even when it seems as though God has forgotten us because of God's silence, God is still looking over our situation. God is feeling our pain. And God knows when and how to intervene. Hallelujah. Joseph was not going to let anybody try to take him out of what he had dreamed. He was willing to go and humble himself before Mary and beg her forgiveness for not believing her. He was willing to endure the scorn and ridicule of others who would label him as the guy who just couldn't wait until the wedding night. 
he wasn't as righteous as they had first thought. Joseph's goal was to get back on track thanks to the wisdom that had come from on high. When he woke up, he went to get Mary and took her home as his wife. But they waited until after Jesus was born to engage in intimacy. The Holy Spirit used Matthew to connect the event in the Old Testament with Isaiah and King Ahaz to the New Testament event of Mary and Joseph in writing the Gospel of Matthew. In verse number 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. There is joy, brothers and sisters. And knowing that God is with us in the midst of this trying period in our history all over this world. COVID-19 has affected so many. But I want to assure you, brothers and sisters, that in the midst of the death toll, in the midst of so many being infected by this virus, I want to remind us that God is with us. And there is joy in knowing that God is with us every step of the way. Our Father in heaven, we bless you. We thank you. We give you praise this morning for the assurance of knowing that you are with us. You are closer than hands and feet. You are with us every step of the way, even in moments when we are unable to feel you or sense that you are there. Yet you remind us that you are with us. Thank you for being with us. As we go through the rest of this week, in the weeks to come, in the month of December, thank you for your guidance. Lead on, O King Eternal. And we give you praise. And we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing with us on Inspirational Moments. We do hope and pray that this time of sharing together has been a source of blessing to you. If you wish to correspond with Reverend Glenn, his mailing address is gemiller64 at hotmail.com or you can telephone him at 467-8939. If you've never made a confession of faith, you don't know him as Lord and Master, hey, this is your moment. Just say, come into my life. Lord, have right away with me. Say, Emmanuel, come be with me. And if you prayed that prayer, salvation has come to your house. May the blessings of God Almighty be yours now. Have a great and a God-filled day.